nations bow to me. Hey, Mercury here, and this uh, video will be about how to become a better deck builder. Uh, first off, I'm going to start by saying this. This video is not made for every card game player out there. Uh, sometimes all you need to do in card games is just uh, control C, control V, a deck code, and play a deck. That's it. You don't need to do anything else. Uh, but if you do enjoy making your own stuff, or if you like making something that works for a certain rank, or just maybe all the way, like if you're that good, if you get that good at it, or if you just don't like uh, to copy the same things and play the same boring things over and over, then this video is for you. So what do you benefit by learning how to deck build? Well, you understand what makes a good deck much faster than what a regular person would understand it by. A regular person would look at a deck and be like, okay, I'm going to play it. And then when they play it, they notice the power, like the power plays. But when you look at a deck, you can kind of perceive how the turns will play out and understand it much faster than what most people will do. Because when you're making decks frequently, you gain that skill of understand, like playing a deck a game through your like playing a game with that deck you're making through your mind you don't need to play a lot of games to, like things click much faster for you that's one thing a second thing is that say you queue with a bilgewater ionia champless deck into the ladder if your opponent sees that like they're clicking on your deck they're confused as heck they're like well well, uh, I, I don't know what to do. I'm just, uh, uh what do I mulligan for? Is this control? Is this aggro? Is this mid range? What, what is, what the hell is happening? And they just don't understand what your deck is about. So unpredict unpredictability, by default, and I'm serious about this, it makes you have an easier time queuing because the opponent can't always save that vengeance for Nautilus on turn seven, for an example. They don't know what your power play is going to be. They have no clue. And that's very, very, like, useful for you to climb with. Sometimes you just want to cheese the opponent out. And being a deck builder makes you cheese much more efficiently because you can surprise the opponent by something brand new. Right? Another important aspect, which is the fact that all the good players, like I'm talking top tier, absolute top tier, and streamers as well, they're all good deck builders. Why is that? Well, um, for an example, let's talk about uh, when Swim got to rank 1 with uh, this deck. Uh, he's on the Master's Ladder, and to be number 1 with the best competitive deck out there, you need to be the actual undisputed best card game player ever, and you need to be lucky. Like, you, you can just run out of luck. So how do you, for an example... Well, I don't want to say get an advantage, but uh, it kind of is. Like, how do you make your deck building help you achieve a target? Well, uh, Swim back then did a deck called Prankster Burn. And it was a simple Shadow Isles, uh, Piltover and Zon Burn deck with, I think, Teemo and Phantom Prankster. And uh, Cask Salesman. Like, it was just, you know, uh, a like a regular burn deck. But he took it in a meta that didn't predict it and he managed to make it so well and refine it so well with the ratioing and everything that he got to number one with it so like if you are say an actual masters player then deck building is still a skill that you need regardless of anything like without deck building you're gonna struggle a fourth aspect that people do also ignore is the fact that you can just deck build for fun you like Improving the skill of deck building will make your fun decks also better. Like for an example, say you are making Boros or if you are making a Yasuo deck, because that's how Yasuo got to like that that that's how Yasuo like how bad Yasuo is right now. Um say you're making a bad deck, like or a meme deck, and you take it to normals and you keep losing and you never get that combo out that you always wanted to do. That sucks. You didn't have fun doing that. But if you make your deck better, even for memes, you're going to have more fun automatically because you're going to be pulling off your combo better. Like I remember I was playing Gauntlet yesterday and I was very salty 
that this guy running Karma plus Marauders ran into me. He managed to get that combo off. And I was very salty. But now, now that I realize it, he's just a good deck builder, right? Like, he took something that's spicy. I'll say that. It's not great. And he managed to make something that wins out of it. So that's, like, that's very, very fun. Like, that's another important aspect of deck building. So yeah, um, hopefully the those four reasons actually got you into deck building because I'm about to discuss how to become a better deck builder right now. So how do you improve a skill like uh, deck building? Well, there are three or four different steps that you go for to make a deck. Let's let's make something from scratch. I, I don't think I'm going to go uh, with it right now. I mean, I, I honestly can. I think, uh, okay, let's go with something very simple. Demacia. Bannerman has been forgotten for the longest time, right? It, it's been really, like, almost marginalized. And the new card from Chirima just came in, which uh, helps these uh, new Demacian elite cards that like challenging. Like, um, Honored Lord. Where is he? Like, Honored Lord, for an example, is a good card that's elite that likes challenging there's also gallant squire which is a four mana four four that transforms into a five five tough which tough matters really much in this meta uh, when it challenges so what's a decent plan to make uh, this new challenging archetype well there is first off benson squire which is a, a basic uh drop that's like not not groundbreaking to, to think of but there's also a card that's one of the strongest cards we've gotten this literal like expansion even the, the first one merciless hunter this is a three mana four three fearsome which is already decent stats for a, a, a non-champion the only thing we have like four three fearsome and three is callista i think there's also a spider but that needs an enabler to work and this also grants an enemy vulnerable so it works really really well with something like honor lord it, it curves into it like that that's a simple plan that we're discussing right now right like it, it's a, an idea of oh uh well what works with challengers oh this card does this card enables them that's that's the basic concept and now you're just thinking okay well how do i fill the rest of the deck and then after that simple concept you start filling with cards that would work okay so Allegiance maybe three to five cards. I would add one or two exhaust. I think one because this card might this deck might be like running low on draw anyways because it's a Demacia deck. And you just start adding in decks. Okay, do I want to go full on elites or Renekton? Probably Renekton because elites themselves are kind of meh. You would add a lot of elites anyways by the end. But generally speaking, you do want to um, run something like uh, what's it called? Maybe, maybe even skip Bannerman at this point if you're going Renekton. Like, you, you can just go uh, stuff like Sith, Rear the Bold, uh, Screeching Dragon, maybe one because of Garen. Uh, by the way, Garen really likes being Challenger as well because they he can pick and choose uh, what cards he wants. But maybe Radiant Guardian is better here because of the, the fact that it's a uh, very fast meta. So maybe you're just running away. And yeah, like, that's how the process goes. So, okay, let's, let's just add a few more cards to uh, not like dwell too much on it uh let's see so yeah another card that helps challengers maybe uh, we need an early curve uh single combat sharp sight i think these are must-haves in every demacian deck uh at this point at least uh so another three draw probably maybe a redeemer is good for a draw uh one more gallant rider to make it four four drops that really like challenging so both all four drops curve well into Merciless. Uh, what else? What else? What else? So something like... Like, yeah, just just maybe maybe two Concerteds as well because we're kind of low on spells. Like, it, it, you can never really go wrong with Concerted Strike. Uh, do you run one right? Maybe you do run one right. Like, it's not too... Uh, not, not too big of an issue. Uh, yeah, Rock Hopper would be nice. Like, yeah, that's the, 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 that's the plan, right? That is the plan. So how many elites are we on? So that's three, that's uh, three, six, nine. Yeah, I would at this point run Sithria as well. Oh, you want to be running three exhaust with something like Renekton though. 
but yeah like th th that's that's the basic concept of something like this is that you are just filtering through cards thinking them through just cascading all the cards that would work with this deck in a row like this and uh just just making a full deck out of it right that that's it i think uh this also just you might need preservarium okay i'm not gonna go throughout the, f the full process but that's that's how you do the first like start of a deck i'm gonna get back to that idea later but for now that's what you like you do to get a deck going okay well i made a deck let's say okay let's go to this because this is what i made day one let's discuss what what went through my head so this is a zoe zillion deck i think i made a video if you didn't see it it's just a value deck you're trying to generate cards by mountain goat sketcher uh by doing by by solari priestess fangs invokes you know invokes and using predicts to uh predict the cards that you exactly need maybe you feel like you need a comet so you're predicting the ancient preparation or scrying sands or zillion for a solari priestess Maybe you're predicting for Rite of Negation versus a deck that you feel fear has Ruination or Reckoning or Atrocity. Uh, maybe you're predicting for Hush because it's a Overwhelm deck that buffs something like Sharima Overwhelm. Like that's that that was the basic concept in my head or something like Asses obviously. And yeah, that that was the the plan, right? Now, what comes next after I put a pile of cards together? Well. The second and most important uh, bit is playing the crap out of your deck. So you need to be just play, even if you're losing, you need to accept. That's why, by the way, it's really good at the, the beginning. If say you you reset at the floor of a rank, you're just playing. You don't really care about, especially if you want to make something, right? Like if you just want to climb back up, sure, go ahead, just uh, play whatever works. But usually you're not, you want to, be playing something that you're uh, trying to make especially early into a set because uh, that's when you have the space to climb as well as improve the deck because everybody's still playing stuff that are unrefined so you're not going to be too punished for playing something unrefined but um, like that's the, the most important step because you need to be really really patient with your deck like if I if, if it went south here, instead of me saying ah screw it this doesn't work zillion doesn't work with Zoe, I would be thinking okay well, why doesn't this work? Like okay so another uh, I'm gonna discuss a concept about uh, Veil Temple. My biggest like even thought before I play this deck was that Time Bomb is a great cantrip for Temple. So first off, what does cantrip mean? It means that it's a card that does like some literal utility for, for cheap and then it replaces itself with a draw good cantrips are fail cascade guiding touch and here time bombs time bombs work exactly as you would want them out of temple you can just play a time bomb and that's one out of two uh, actions or if you play it as the second option you're literally left with the same mana that you started the action with you buffed something plus one and you play the time bomb which do you one and it will deal one to the all like it works really well with temple right that that was a very potentially good concept in my head and it still can be right like uh, it still can be but in the new version i just removed it after playing because that's what playing did i ran into too many aurelia azirs that i started realizing okay temple does not work tempo at least for now because it's too slow like if, if a deck is trying to finish me by six or seven at most i'm gonna be getting my mana back with tempo not getting more mana the plan with tempo is to just get more mana that than the investment that you put in if you're just breaking even it doesn't work you lost tempo for nothing so yeah i abandoned that i that 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 plan now the third and another important uh, fact after playing a deck is realizing what you want it to transform into. So, for an example, for an example, I was playing uh, this Merciless Hunter card to figure it out a little bit more, see what uh, I want from it. If, uh, it's probably a strong card, so it will have really strong utility. 
But um, I think I was on... Uh, I don't remember if I was on 3 Mountain Goat at the very beginning. But I was playing and I would see Azir on 3 and I would drop Merciless and I would be like... Man, if I kept the gem for hand right now, I would just trade Azir into Merciless, and it will feel really good. But then I remembered, Sand Spinner does that. Like, on 4. He drops Azir on 3. If he's attacking on 3, anyways, I'm gonna be just dropping Sand Spinner on 4, and I will be trading into it. Like, after playing a little bit more, you, you're, the, your head starts clicking more with what you want to do. Like, another thing. I, I used to have two fangs and no, like, potential saves. But after playing a few games versus uh, Rolia Azir, I would be thinking, okay, well, if I invoke this Moonglow out of fangs, which is, I can't bring it up here because it's a Celestial. Moonglow is a grand plus zero plus two and spell shield, which makes fangs a three, four lifesteal. That's very good. That's very good into something like Rolia Azir. It turns into your little tiny Radiant Guardian in a sense. Which is just blocking all these stupid, dumb swings. And you can just... Run some Bliss Vigor for that. Right? Technically, like, it, it works really well with this. Works really well with saving a Zoe. Works really well with saving Zillion. If you really need to, you're mo mostly not going to be doing it. But yeah, you're starting to develop a sense for what your deck needs to be to be better. And this just turned into a versus aggro, a stall with a lifesteal unit, or with star shaping or a guiding touch or a targon, and just develop your tiny win conditions, either just generating value, doesn't need to be leveling Zoe, or leveling Zoe versus something that lacks the removal, like Aurelia Azir, or just developing Zillion if you high roll and draw all the bombs. By the way, I don't think you ever just keep predicting looking for the bombs. That's never going to work and you're going to waste your time. But yeah, like, you're just... When you... Like, after you play the deck, it leads to an important bit, which is adding text or refining. That's that's the biggest bit. And you gain that by playing and trying to do it a lot. Like, I d by the way, this was not, like, my first attempt. This took me, like, 40 to 50 games to come up with. At first, I removed only one tempo. And I was like, uh... What do I add? What do I add? I can't remember what card that... Oh, I wanted... I tried something with Mentor too. Like, I started trying to run Sparklefly and Mentor. That didn't work. It didn't feel great. It felt lacking. Um, I also tried... I wanted to run Sunhawk in this. Didn't feel anything. I ran Triple Pale Cascade at a point. I tried Spell Thief. I removed Soothsayer. Like, there were so many trial and error things. That's the patience in this process, in these all, all these processes, like in deck building in general, the patience is very key. Like if I was not patient and just disregarded the idea back then, I wouldn't be so happy with how, I, how it feels right now. This deck feels really, really good into something like a really Azir in my opinion. Unless they really, really high roll and draw double Marshall, double Azir, double Aurelia or something or like double die plus double azir which by the way double die plus double azir is still very very winnable if you draw fangs and merciless or fangs and bakai sand spinner but still like you get the the concept that i'm getting to here is that after you play you start to realize what cards you want to add the text that you want to add and you just realize how like how much you want from them how good you want like how like which good cards you want to add and that's what i'm getting to which is the fourth and final point how many of a card do you run so some guy that i was literally talking to online on discord told me this uh, i think maybe nine to ten months ago and it was a very like simple and generalized it's not always the case but it was crucial in me understanding how to ratio properly which is a rule that simply says, if you're running a 3 of of a card, expect to draw it often. Like, you're always going to draw Sketcher, you're always going to draw Zoe, you're always going to draw Goat, Zillion, Merciless, Priestess. I'm not saying every game, but very, very quite often. You're going to draw it. And you shouldn't be mad be that you, you drew it because you want to draw it as, mu as, long, as much as possible. That's the plan with running a 3 of. Okay, well how about a 2 of? Two of is something that you also want to draw often, not every time. 
but you don't want to overdraw. Like, if I open a hand with double scrying sands, I'm sad because, well, first off, I can't, like, chain them, chain them in a turn. It's a minus one for only two attack. And you can't, if, if you use them twice in a turn, you're predicting twice, so you're ruining your first predict. And it's very, like, low, like, no tempo almost, right? So, overdrawing it feels bad. Same with engine preparation, which, which, by the way, I started at three and then realized, no, I only want two. If I drew it early or even drew it mid-game, I only draw it, need to draw it once in a game, generally. Same with some plus vigor. I think overdrawing that is bad. Bell Cascade, you need to chain, like, do something and then chain it afterwards. So, overdrawing it can brick your hand. Triple Hush is very, very low on tempo. A triple Sand Spinner can be clunky because it's a four drop, so if you're going to be playing them... Uh, like, it's, it's gonna get to turn 6, and that's your turn only player a turn or something. A Rite of Negation, uh, very low on tempo as well. So, like, you get the idea. Like, if you're running cards at lower ratios than 3, you don't want to be drawing overlapping copies of them. Maybe some turns you are, but, like, you're if the, at that point, you're either keeping them in, in the starting hand or something, or just fishing for them using draws or here predicts. Like, yeah, it's better to just run two ofs in cases where you don't want to draw too many copies of a thing. Now, what are one ofs? I think one ofs is, is one of the hardest things that you want to explain because it can still scratch your head, but I'll try to explain it as, uh, as, as much as I can. Say you're in Shadow Isles, like theoretically, you're in Shadow Isles, and you're a control deck, and sometimes you just run into these very mid-range decks that play four to five units aboard, and you're having trouble removing all of them. That's a bad matchup, right? Like you're gonna be expecting that. So what do you do? If you're like running into too many of them, if you're running into too many of them, you're gonna be running like two ruination. If if you know that they they're gonna fall for it anyways. I used to have a deck with Rasharal and so and it, and it ran two ruinations very comfortably. Um, so yeah, you're, you're drawing one of them. Sometimes you brick on two, but like you always want to see it. But what if you see them very, like occasionally, or you don't care about the matchup enough because you want other cards to be run, but at the same time you do see them. So you run one Ruination. So what does one Ruination do? If you run into that matchup and you draw Ruination, you win, right? Like it's a, it's not, it's a non-frequent one. But if you do run into that one matchup, say I'm versus Ash and it's Marauders and they use Strength and Numbers and I'm Shadow Isles and I have Ruination in hand. I stop their, their big play. It's gone with, with whatever was on the board as well. And they can't do anything about it. Right? So that's what a one-off does. Okay, but what if you don't draw it? Well, the matchup never changed. That was a bad deck that you were about to run into and the matchup doesn't really change. And you don't like lose much on doing that because you're gonna not you're you're not gonna draw it every game. In fact, no, you're gonna draw it maybe 30 20 percent of the time, maybe even. Like it depends on how unlucky you are, obviously. <laughs> but like yeah, a one of is one thing that you don't want to see frequently, but you want to be happy when you see it. Like right of negation, for an example. Now is not a great time for right of negation. It's very everything is very fast. Like, you want to have one of them at most, because if you overdraw them, it's really bad. Maybe some decks do like two, but I think, for the most part, one is fine. For an example, say you run into, well, another Marauders deck, and they're playing that Strength and Numbers. Usually, you're not going to live throughout the second Strength and Numbers anyways. So you know that they're a Marauders deck, so you start predicting for it, or drawing for it, and you find it, and you're happy. If you don't, then, I mean, that's that's how things started anyways. Uh, in other uh, matchups where you don't want deny, you're not gonna be, which is right of negation. You're not gonna be seeing it often because it's a one-off, and you're fine with that, because even if you did see it, it's it's one brick. Like you, you, it's not like for an example, uh, a deck that doesn't care at all about hush, and you draw both of them. By the way, there is almost no deck that doesn't care about hush, which is why I'm running two of it. Uh, but there are decks that just don't care about deny. They're all fast speed. Except for a few spells. So, like, that's why you run one of It's to not be fully committed to a play that you're running into your deck, 
but it would be for a card that you will be happy to see because it will just straight up win you matchups. I hope, I hope, hope, hopefully that explained it enough. I, I don't know how else to explain it. It's just better to run one deny than not run it at all, uh, because of how game winning it can be. Like I remember one time I was, uh, I had a zillion in hand, I think, or either a zillion or Scrang's hands, and I saw deny in my my predict my predictions, and I was like, okay, maybe he's running atrocity here. It was Trun uh, Trundle, Lissandra, and. They didn't play Matron yet, so I was suspecting that it's the control variant that runs Atrocity. And I got it just in case. And I literally was attacking with a 13 uh, attack Grey Beyond into their 11 health. So they couldn't like Vile Feast out of it, they had to Vengeance or something. Like Vile Feast Vengeance. And even then, I would have denied both. And by the way, they did go for the Atrocity. And it failed because of how Deny works. So that's what I'm saying. That's what I mean. It's like some cards that are really crucial to some matchups. You're just you just rather like have that one off, try to fit, fetch for it, draw it, predict it for when you need it. Um. So yeah. Uh. That that covers it. Um. I think I did like covered all the uh, important aspects of deck building. Uh, honestly, uh, one advice that I would give to general deck building is, again, for all those steps, you need to be patient. Like, even, even, here's the thing, the first few attempts that you're gonna have at deck building will feel awful. Like, nobody ever, ever in this game was born with the, the gift of being a good deck builder. Like, uh, Swim, who makes a lot of decks, I'm not gonna say every deck Swim made ever is good because I remember that uh, at the beginning of the game he was very uh, persuasive about this deck called Dawn, Dawn Spiders and when you consider the, the, the concept now it's like oh, this is way too slow but the thing is everybody was still at the infancy of a game that it still worked and he still won a, a lot of games with it. I think it was considered a tier 1 or a tier 2 by, back then. And it was just a deck that killed a unit and buffed the rest of the board by one at the end of the turn. And that was like still very slow compared to something that came out later which is just Vanguard Bannerman Allegiance which you made use of these stats much quicker and much more efficiently. Um, but yeah, like that's what I'm trying to say that not every first attempt is gonna be good you're gonna have some really really awful decks at the beginning and the most important tip to get through that is to be patient and trust your gut if you really like a deck just keep going for it keep improving it and once you feel like you, you did everything you can for that deck then just move on to something else um yeah that that's it uh hopefully you enjoyed the video hopefully it was uh, useful to any of you and uh, if you have any questions if you are like watching this video just uh, leave them in the comments and I will be responding and uh, yeah uh, have a great day